He's been covering the NBA for 14, 15 years. Mark Medina, NBA writer, is joining us now, as he is prone to do. We invite him on often. So I want to start. Uh, the college basketball's had, I don't know if it's a renaissance, women's basketball is going through an incredible growth spurt led by Caitlin Clark and Juju Watkins and some big stars. But uh, you know, Zach Eady, so I, I was under the impression, I'd watched Zach Eady play, and I was like, he doesn't move very well. And my take was, who's he going to guard in the NBA? And then I thought a lot about Anthony Davis. Now, Anthony's an elite defender, probably the best defender in the league, big guy. But Anthony, the Lakers for the first few years in L.A., they tried to push him outside. And he wasn't a very good shooter. And in the end, he moved back in this year. And he's been dominant. And I know we want all these bigs to shoot, but there's not a lot of Jokic's. Giannis doesn't shoot. AD doesn't shoot. Embiid's not great. I mean, let's be honest. Jokic is one of one, historically. Sabonis, who I covered, could shoot a three. But I, I look at Zach Eady, and I think small ball was largely the Warriors. A lot of people tried. <laughs> Phoenix, Houston, Brooklyn. It was the Warriors. It was Stephen Clay. This is a big man's game. Luke is the biggest guard. Magic was the biggest guard. LeBron's the biggest three. Big beats small. And I look at Zach Eady and I'm like, can he get 14 minutes a night? Nobody else is stopping Giannis, Embiid, and Jokic. They're what he can't. He's seven to four. I mean, what do you hear around the league? You have your sources. You're, you talk about it. What do they say? Yeah, not clear where Zach Eady would be selected in the NBA draft, presuming that he's going to declare himself eligible. But I think there's a sense that he's NBA ready. And I think the one one of the things that we have to keep in mind when you're talking about small ball, I remember covering Mike D'Antoni, and he would always push back at that whole idea of small ball. He would say it's skill ball. So I think the only thing that is different in today's NBA than in the past as it pertains to bigs is the post, you know, the post-up game is more inefficient than it is. But if you're a dominant big that can get to the rim off of pick and rolls and fast breaks, those are easy baskets. That's what the modern NBA calls for. It's not just about threes. It's about can you get to the basket and can you get free throws? And I think Zach Eady can provide those two things. Yeah, he's also been a great free throw shooter. And a lot of bigs, Duncan, Shaq, were not great free throw <laughs> shooters. So what he can he can finish and he can get to the line and hit those shots. So I was I was asking uh, this question. It's kind of the unanswered question. I don't know if it's because California has four teams in the NBA uh, or we have better winter weather. But since Jordan retired, you've had twice as many championships out west. You've had a Spurs dynasty, a Laker dynasty, a Warrior dynasty, and Denver may be the next. You've had no Eastern dynasties. LeBron had to move around to get him. Cleveland, Miami. Steph didn't have to move. Duncan didn't have to move. Jokic won't have to move. And I look at it and I think most things in sports you can explain. College men's basketball has eroded the, the, the ratings for years. Well, it's the one and done. It's just a, it's a turnstile. People like, they like these women stars who are there every year. What do you, what explains the Western dominance? We were showing this the other day. The Warriors and the Lakers, these are good teams. I mean, Lakers went to Boston without AD and LeBron and beat the Celtics. They've beaten Milwaukee there. The bottom of it is Warriors, Lakers, Suns, Kings are fighting for their playing spot. These are really good teams. Why is the West so much better? So I think there's four reasons that don't have much to do with geography, but with circumstances. One, you have the Lakers. They've always been a franchise that gets the star players. Two, San Antonio, they were the model fr franchise of continuity, efficiency, building around a generational talent like Tim Duncan. The Golden State Warriors, they became a dynasty starting with Steph Curry. And then when you're looking at the Eastern Conference landscape, when LeBron James was there in the East with Cleveland, Miami, and then Cleveland again, he was always the, the, the roadblock for all these other teams that couldn't rise above it. So I think those are the main factors that explain the disparity between the West and the East historically, as opposed to just the geographic differences. Because we are going through a bit of a renaissance for the Knicks. They're patient. They're kind of methodical. What a concept. I, no, I mean, my whole <laughs> life, it, it feels like the last 20 years, they've just been a clown show. And like now the Knicks are methodical and patient and developing players and making smart moves, not just big, let's get Amari Stoudemire, big swings from the Suns. It, they're like grown-ups. They're like adults. So I think there, there is a lot to that. Um, you know, I went and watched the Celtics uh, when I was in – I'm going to go watch the Knicks Bulls this Friday in Chicago. But I watched the Celtics um, a couple weeks ago. And nobody played but Tatum, and they won. 
Um, and it is interesting. I was I was talking to somebody in the NBA who does not want me to mention him in this conversation because he has to deal with Tatum and bigwigs in the NBA. And he said, he goes, I like Tatum a lot. I don't think he's terribly intuitive. I um, I think sometimes he's almost gives you a robotic 26. There are certain things that he's just not, he's not willing to be selfish. And most great players are willing at times to just say, it's my ball game. Get out of here. And that's okay. Caitlin Clark last night is like, give me the ball. I'm going <laughs> to score or get you. The that's okay with great scores. Nobody's ever stopped great scores. But I do think there is something. Boston, there's a lot of urgency this year. Jalen Brown just signed a max. Jason Tatum's going to sign a max. You're not keeping Derek White then in the future, who may be the best number five starter in the league. You're not going to have the bench. You can't go get a Porzingis. I do feel like this is a really, I know they're young. Feels like there's a lot of pressure on Boston. Yeah, I mean, they've gone through the playoff uh, rites of passage moments of not gain to, being close to getting to the finals, then getting to the finals and falling to a Golden State Warriors team. I think to the, your point about Jason Tatum, I think whatever shortcomings he's had in the past playoffs have been more about either injuries or just going through the learning adjustments that any star player has. I don't think that there's been any kind of fundamental character deficiency to his game or anything. I think it's just more about how do you package all the skills together? We've seen that he's a great scorer, but how can he be more efficient? I think that he's shown that he can be more efficient this season. His assist numbers are up. Yes. His shots are down. That's a real, uh, I think, testament to wanting to adjust with Jalen Brown, but also the fact that you have Christoph Porzingis on the floor, who's a great floor spacer, another perimeter threat. So I am a Jason Tatum fan. I know there's all those analytics about you know, his crunch time numbers and the stats are what they are, but I think the positive vastly outweighs the good. And while I do have Denver right now as the favorite to win the title because they're the defending champs, Nicole Jokic is really great. They have continuity. Boston's really close to them because of their own continuity and their depth. One of the things that's really difficult um, is the end of a dynasty. Spurs haven't been viable for years. New England crash landed. It's really hard. Um, the dynasty ends, uh, and you just have to make tough choices. I mean, the Bulls were terrible six years after, you know, Michael left for the final time. They were six years bad. And I look at the Warriors, and they're viable, but the hardest part about the ending, the enduring dynasty, is you're going to have to let go of popular stars. And it's really hard. Fans don't want to do it. That's why the late Jerry Krause is like, this is the last year. We're not going to be put that now. They ended up being bad, but I, the Warriors are fascinating to me because like Steph, you can't move off of. And there is clear data that illustrates they're not as good without Draymond. If he plays well, they win like all the time. Um, outside of that, is it reasonable to say everybody's on the trade block? I think it's reasonable to say, but let, I'm as you're talking me through this, I was thinking about a conversation I had with Warriors majority owner Joe Lakeup in 2017. This is the context of they're in the middle of their dynasty run, and I was going through the angle of can they become this generation San Antonio Spurs where they have the continuity, they always have a chance to contend for titles. I remember that point in time he was saying that they're committed toward you know their all-star players with Steph Clay and Draymond, but you know that can easily change if they don't continue to win. And so as it pertains to now, I think everything is on the table, but hear me out, Colin. If I had to make a prediction, I think it's about keeping Clay on a discount deal when he's a free agent and then try to use that money available to round out the rest of the roster. I think when you look at the Warriors, they've always looked at things through a practical and pragmatic lens, meaning th if they're going to keep you know, their whole band of all-stars with, with Steph, you know, uh, uh, most notably, but with Clay and Draymond, it's not going to be for nostalgic purposes. It's going to be for practical purposes, and this is the best options available. And I think even though there's all these moving parts, I think getting Clay on a discounted deal, using that money to round up the rest of the roster is probably the best decision than blowing everything up entirely in hopes that those pieces can give Steph another title run. So one of the things that's great about, you know, you're going to these NBA games every night, you're going to locker rooms. So 
I've always said if I get new information, I have new opinions. I didn't know if Ryan Poles was a good GM for the Bears. I didn't like some of his early moves. His last year, he's been sensational. He's, you know, former offensive lineman built the O-line draft capital, all the other stuff. So Anthony Davis, I had heard that people in the league, because remember, he was going to go to the Lakers, but other people would get a shot. People that I trusted said he's soft. He, does, he has a dad bod. He's naturally gifted, but he's just, he's hurt a lot. And so he comes to L.A., and he's gifted, but he's hurt a lot. And then after the bubble title, LeBron wanted to hand him the baton. Like, bro, I'm going to take about eight minutes left. And he was out of shape, came into camp out of shape. So I was like, let's just move him. This isn't going to work. Something happened about a year and a half ago, and he has been sensational. He plays every night. He plays hard. He doesn't hit the floor as much as he used to. Maybe it's Darvin Ham. Maybe that relationship works. But you're there on a regular basis. I look at him now as the most consistent great player on the Lakers and the best defensive player flat out in the league. I have new information. Is it training, nutrition, LeBron and Nizir, Darvin Ham? Because I'm telling you, two years ago, you couldn't get six straight games out of him. Yeah. He, he would just disappear offensively. What happened? Well, the big, the biggest thing, and you've alluded to it, is he's more available on a consistent basis. And when he's available, he can be that dominant player that everyone envisioned he would be. Now, what's interesting, Colin, is when you talk to Anthony Davis and people around him, their perspective is much different than what people with the Lakers have said. With Anthony Davis, they, he's always said, hey, I've done the same offseason regimen. Injuries, to some degree, are uncontrollable. But I thought it was really notable that before the season started, when Rob Palenka and Darvin Ham were talking about the extension that Anthony Davis signed to last summer, they observed that they felt like he was taking his off-season regimen to a bigger level to be able to maximize his chances to be more available. Yeah. And whether there's shades of truth on both sides or one is more tilting to the Lakers or Davis, regardless, he's been more available this season. The data shows that, that he's been able to not only play more oh, games, but more there, haven't, there haven't been injury scares either. There hasn't been those inconsistent performances. And that's been a game changer because the Lakers, they've had inconsistency this season, but has had nothing to do with LeBron and nothing to do with Anthony Davis. It's been with the role players. And I think that even though there's a lot of question marks about the Lakers and their ceiling, there's added comfort that it's about those role players than about their main stars. Yeah, Jared Vanderbilt, who's long, brings in some size. He's getting healthy. D'Lo, since being benched, has been very, very effective. Finally, I said, if I said to you, okay, there's going to be there's going to be an upset. We're going to have a first round upset. Now we don't know all the matchups yet, but we have a basic feel. Mark Medina, give me something in the first round because we generally don't have a ton because the series are long. But, I mean, we've seen Miami do this to teams before. Miami's the team you always kind of watch. Is there something where you're saying, I don't like what I see with a favorite, I like what I see with an underdog? Well, the NBA, it's unlike the NCAA tournament because it's a seven-game series. But I, I could see if the Sixers avoid the playing tournament that, you know, Joel Embiid is back and ready to go, that they, knock you know, th out. they knock whoever the third seed is off. And then – I could see if the Lakers can draw a first-round matchup with Oklahoma City, that that draws in their favor. They've had regular season Oklahoma success City's against them. Oklahoma City's no older than North Carolina's college <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. They both average 22 and a half years old. And to be clear, with Oklahoma City and with Minnesota, I don't think that they're going to be overwhelmed with the fact that they don't, haven't been on the playoff stage yet. But I think from a tactical adjustment uh, standpoint in a seven-game series, that can make a difference. As it pertains to the Lakers, we've seen the regular season. They match up well against them. If, if LeBron and Anthony Davis are healthy and dominant, that's going to be a tough out for them. Yeah, okay, see, it's not a knock on them at all. Sam Presti, they're really good. That's not a knock. 22-year-old teams outside of the bubble, young teams don't good, do well in the playoffs. And the bubble was circumstantial where the married guys – stunk in the bubble they missed their, <laughs> they, and it was the year like all these young Miami was great in the bubble with a bunch of kids and I think a lot of that was just I mean you're asking these guys hey leave your kids and your family for six weeks and live at a confined well the young guys who were sitting playing video games and basketball they <laughs> love the bubble this is great I get food in my room I don't have to worry about this but uh generally young teams can struggle in the postseason they don't get the whistle they get frustrated stars manipulate refs so my guess is I think I think OKC Lakers is a good call. Mark Medina, as always, great seeing you. Great seeing you as always, too.
Hi, everybody. It's me, Uncle Colin. Subscribe here to get the latest from the herd, including exclusive behind-the-scenes videos and more, wherever you may be, however you may be watching. Thanks again for making us part of your day.